Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 172nd scale M1A2 Tusk II Abrams main battle tank. Now this build here is a little bit different than my usual body of work because I don't really work with the smaller scales like 172 and smaller. The model that you see here is built actually for a relative of mine who dropped the model off for me to finish it off for him. Of course I'll be going over that as the video progresses. Now normally I do take on commission build projects however not in 172nd scale I typically take projects from scales between 135 and 16. As for availability and pricing information on one something like that that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Before we go any further with the video let's go ahead and take a quick walk around the model. And this vehicle here is the M1A2 fitted with the Tusk II up armoring package. As pretty much most of my audience will know, the M1A2 is the current main battle tank which is utilized by the U.S. Armed Forces and is used by both the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps. This vehicle, of course, was developed in the late 1970s and was adopted by the U.S. military in the early and mid-1980s. Since then, the vehicle has undergone a constant upgrade and modernization program, keeping the vehicle up to date with new modern technologies that become available. This would include both armor and electronic packages. After the first Gulf War, in the mid-1990s, the M1 was upgraded to A2 specifications, which gave it several advantages over the legacy A1 and the original M1, which preceded it. This would be the vehicle that the U.S. military would use during the Second Iraq War in 2003. As was the case in the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, the M1 was proved to be a very effective main battle tank. However, just like with all tanks, the vehicle does have some limitations and shortcomings in urban situations. Some of the threats that were being countered by the vehicles were your standard gamut of Soviet light shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons. These would of course include RPG-7s, RPG-2s, and even B-40 rockets. In addition to RPGs, recoilless rifles were another threat that were being utilized by the enemy. Outside of these anti-armor weapons, there are also lots of anti-tank mines, as well as IEDs, where an artillery shell buried in the ground can easily damage a heavy vehicle such as the M1 Abrams. Another threat that were being encountered in the urban environments were also that of sniper fire, with the commander and the loader of the vehicle exposed on the outside of the hatches, they made for easy targets for a fellow with a dragon off. Now the tanks themselves were more than capable of dealing with the RPG threat from the front position as these are the portions of the armor which are very very strong and are thick enough to thwart a warhead shaped charge like an RPG. However the problem in an urban situation has to do with the tank being e easily engaged from the flanks and also the rear. In order to address these threats, the military developed the TUSK package. TUSK is an abbreviation for Tank Urban Survival Kit. The first iterations of these kits were developed in the mid to late 2000s time period. The kits consisted of reactive armor plates which were to be bolted to the pre-existing side skirts of the vehicle. To better protect the tank against IEDs, a applicant armor panel was mounted to the lower plate of the vehicle. To protect the commander and the loader from sniper fire, a Crow's remote control weapon station was mounted next to the commander's cupola, which replaced the standard M2HB that the tank commander would have access to. The loader would have a sheet metal shield fitted around his M240, the Tusk package did offer a lot of benefits compared to the tank previously. However, there was still some more room for improvement, and this led to the Tusk 2 upgrade package. What the Tusk 2 package had was it utilized the same reactive armor side skirt panels for the side of the hull, but over the side skirt 
reactive armor tiles themselves, they added these semicircular plates which offered even more protection against threats. The same type of plates and reactive armor tiles were also this time incorporated onto the turret sides as well. Some other modifications also had to do with the loader's M240. The sheet metal shield did offer some ballistic protection against sniper fire, however, some complaints that emerged was that the shields did inhibit some visibility and situational awareness that the machine gunner can have access to. Because of this, the unit was redesigned and rather than just a plain sheet metal shield, the, the entire loader's hatch area had a ballistic wall built up with very thick ballistic glass panel inserts which gives ballistic protection and it also allows visibility for the person manning the gun. The commander's cupola also received the same treatment. The, in lieu of the crow system, the tank standard M2HB was still mounted back onto its traditional spot on the cupola, but again, a armored tub was erected around it. This tub also had, again, visibility windows present. This package is very similar to what was done to the Humvees, as well as also what is commonly seen on Israeli vehicles as well. Another bit of kit which was borrowed heavily from the Israelis had to do with the mounting of an M2HB 50 caliber machine gun over the tank's main gun barrel. The purpose of this was to give the tank more firepower in dealing with threats such as RPG teams or even SAGR teams. Even though the tank does have a coax M240 machine gun, the 50 caliber gives added punch and it can defeat other obstacles like walls and other structures that can be used as cover by anti-armor teams. The 50 caliber bullet has better penetration compared to the standard 7.62 NATO round fired by the coax M240. Other than this up-armoring package, automotive-wise and armament-wise, the vehicle is exactly the same. They still utilize the same Rheinmetall 120mm smoothbore gun, as well as the standard jet turbine engine found on the standard M1A2 SEP Abrams. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started, or in this case, dropped off, in order to get a good idea on what the condition of this model was in when it was first dropped off at the shop. And here's the model at the start of the project. For the base starter kit, the model is that of a 172nd scale M1A2 SEP Abrams with the TUS2 conversion set from Tiger Model. Tiger Model is a relatively new model company. They've been producing kits for about five or so years now and they've been primarily building kits in 135th scale. Their 135th scales are very nicely done and are on par with the other super kits that are available on the market. In addition to their 135th scale line, they also apparently have a 172nd scale line of models as well. Now their models are all injection molded plastic, however they do also include several frets of photo etch. Now being 172nd scale, this is the type of model that I don't really work in. I'm not really into the whole braille scale and 172nd scale scene. The reason why you see this model here on this desk today is because this model here is actually a rescue. The model belongs to a relative of mine and the fellow started the build, worked on it on and off for about a year. However, he hit a point where he made a mistake in the model and um, he got so disgusted with trying to repair the mistake that he actually damaged it and was about to throw it in the trash. He basically gave me an ultimatum where, listen, John, I have this model kit here. I screwed it up. Either you can rebuild it, otherwise it's going to go in a landfill. Of course, I can't just let someone just throw away a perfectly good model, specifically one of this quality. So I decided to take it under my wing and repair it, getting it up to its completed state. And that's exactly why we have it here. Otherwise, I'm not really into the 172nd scale range. Being a current release model kit, these things are very common on the internet. and can be acquired from Amazon or eBay. Basically, any online retailer should have these. Starting with the model's graph design, it's very Tamiya-esque with both the typography as well as also the illustration and even the basic overall design of the box. We have here a simple white background, tank in the foreground, which is nicely rendered and painted. And we have a little stripe here of gray just for looks. Here's the Tiger Model web, or the, I should say, the logo. 
Again, very Tamiya-esque in its overall appearance with that even of the profile color palette. Sides. And here goes some more, again, Tamiya-ish type advertising. Cracking open the box, we'll reveal the contents. Now, like I said before, the model was partially started by the individual, so it's going to be built basically halfway through compared to the other type of build that you see me done in the past. Starting with the tank's lower hull, you'll see that the wheels and track are basically molded as one piece. This is a common feature found on a lot of 130, or I should say 172nd scale tanks on the market. Now, this tank does have individual length and length, which we all know I can't stand, and the reason why I can't stand them is basically exactly for the reason that you see it here. Trying to get these track links to assemble around a round object and stay perfectly straight is definitely a fool's errand, and I don't care how many tutorials are out there, it's basically a really shitty way to do tracks. So, this is the lower hull. Now, I'm not going to be able to do anything with this here, I'm just going to work what is given to me. And these tracks are basically going to stay as is, even the, once I'm done with my paintwork. Which, they should hold up pretty well, even once fully painted and weathered. Here we have the turret. You can see here the PE, used for that of the grill work, which is a very nice feature. The fellow went ahead and assembled basically most of everything that you see here. Here we have the M240. Detailing is very nice, specifically again for the small scales represented. There is the bulletproof glass, which is that of clear plastic. Nice little feature. I believe clear plastic was also used for the CITV lens on the front, and also on the gunner's optic. Like I said before, these are very, these are actually very advanced kits. And you can see even on the tooling, even though it's 172nd scale, the pieces are nicely and crisply rendered. <laughs> and here goes the reason why this model was almost tossed. The guy was building it, he glued the fenders on. Unfortunately, he forgot that this is a Tusk II, which has a different set of fenders, and he glued on the fenders for a standard Abrams. When he noticed this, he tried to pry the pieces off and got this really chewed up effect that we have here. This here was basically the death nail of the project for him and was about to meet its end or meet its fate in a garbage can. So we'll go ahead and fix this momentarily. Here goes the runner. We have here, of course, the armor sides. And here go the side skirts that need to be utilized as well as some more Tusk II components. Commander's Cupola, M2HB, and more details. Getting further in the box, there's mostly an empty runner here. Some more options for that of cupulas. This one here looks like for that of an M1A1. This one here is for the M1A2. There's the counterweight in the back, which I believe is if you have the mine plow, or the mine roller, but I might be mistaken. And, again, just some ore runners. Again, the runners themselves, the layout, and even the plastic use, very Tamiya-esque in feel and in finish. Here we have a clear runner with some more components on it. Some of the botched-up fenders and side shirts. A color palette, a fret of PE, and here are the instructions. Again, if I didn't say any better, and I, I could swear I was looking at a set of instructions from Tamiya. From here now, I can start the repair process, and hopefully when I'm done, the model should be pre representable. 
Now to start with the repair process, first thing I have to do is to get the hull down to a nice flat manner. Because of the way these Abrams kits are designed, you do have this side skirts when they get glued on, get mounted in this position here, which has a lot of the side detailing found on it. Now this is good in that this makes the removal process all that much easier in that I don't have to worry about salvaging any sort of side hull detailing because all these will be replaced by the side detailing here on the replacement side skirts. Now to remove this, the best way to do it is with that of a file. Now I'm basically, basically just going to go up and down on the side hulls here with that of the file and stop once all of the glued on component remnants are totally removed and are nice and flush. After that, I can then start preparing these sides without a little bit of bodywork. And here's the same upper hull now with the all that clunk and stuff file away. As I said before, I just used the file and I just went up and down and side to side on the surfaces until finally all of the remnants of the pieces that were glued on just buckled away. Already the pieces look much better and are now ready for their next step. If I go ahead and pop the upper hull onto the lower, you'll see that the only thing remain, remaining to do now is to remove these chunks of plastic holes that we have here. Once these holes are filled in, the side will then be pretty much fully repaired and I can then progress with the rest of the build. Now like I said before, this side here is pretty good and any chips and gouges that are remaining are going to be covered up with that of the side skirt detailing. The real problem is with this side. Now like I said before, there are several cavities that need to be covered up. Now to cover them up I am going to use a little bit of red putty, however you can't just put the putty in these locations here due to the size of the gaps. The red putty is just not going to be able to hold up with the thinnesses required in order to get the piece nice and buffed. In order to do this I need to build up the inner side here which acts as a good backstop for that of the putty. Now for the material I use a little thin strip of Plastruct. Now I'm not sure what the size is I just know it's an evergreen strip and unfortunately the size I'm not able to put on screen as this piece I just found running around loose in my Plastruct bin. Now the piece has been glued on, now I'm going to go ahead and square everything off so that the bottom is nice and flat and then from there I can go ahead and add on the red putty. Once the glues are fully dry, it's then time to square off and remove the extra portion of the plastic. Once everything is squared off with the upper hull, it's then time to add the red putty. Now a common question I get in emails and in comment sections, what exactly do I use for bodywork on my models? And the answer that I give in the truth is this material right over here. This here is red glazing and spot putty. It's from USC. This material is very easily found online with a simple Google search and it's sold basically through online auto store and body repair type companies. Now this stuff here is the same stuff that I use on basically every single one of my builds from a 135 all the way up to a 116 and even a 1 6 scale build all utilize this material. The material itself is the pre-mixed version. Now when it comes time to buying putty there are two versions to watch out for. This is the pre-mixed type where it's ready to go out of the tube and then there's a type which looks very similar to this but has a little extra tube of hardener in which you need to mix it together in order to get it to, hard to solidify. That stuff you want to avoid and is really not suitable for plastic models. The one that I use here is the way to go. Now the material itself is basically chemically identical to the Model Master red putty and it's also very similar to Squadron Green putty which is basically the standard that almost most model builders tend to go with. Only with this material here it's a lot more affordable and you do get a lot more volume of it which lasts a lo lot longer compared to using the other materials I mentioned before. The stuff even smells identical to that of the testers red putty which by the way having said that do not go ahead and start huffing putties that's just insane you don't want to do that now with one of my gloves off I'm gonna go ahead and apply the putty and I just simply 
mirror a little dab on in these two respective locations. And that's it. It is at this point now where I go ahead and let the putty fully dry. Once it is dry, I can then just sand it away with some fine sandpaper. With the last of the repairs now made, the model was then finished up, and at this point here, it's ready for painting. With the turret removed, I could go into more detail on the hull. And here we have the hull now as one piece. Shortly after the bodywork and repairs were made, it was then time to fuse the two halves together. Now, just prior to doing that, I actually was able to remove the track and suspension clusters, which, if we could recall, were glued onto the model by the previous builder at this point. The reason why I removed them has to do with the ease of painting. With the units removed from the tank, I could go ahead and get the entire upper and lower hull into its base coat, and I can also go ahead and thoroughly paint all of the suspension components when they're off the model. Being one piece, they would simply lock back onto their appropriate locations for final assembly. Now, removing the pieces wasn't too difficult. In fact, one of the components just popped off my hand and was a happy accident, and then the other one shortly followed. It is because of this why I do not recommend people utilizing the old school testers red tube model glue, like this old leftover bottle that I have here. This was the adhesive that the previous builder used, and he tends to like using it on his models. This glue, even though it is very affordable, tends to be more on the lower end. It's harder to use, it's thicker, it's chunkier, and on top of that, it just doesn't have very good longevity when it's in terms of its bonds. Pieces I have seen and myself use this glue, and after a few years or even a few months, the bonds don't exactly hold up too well over time and gradually start falling apart. This is why I always utilize super glue on all of my plastic model builds. Some other seam work that I took care of is right over here where the lower hull makes contact with the rear plate and also where the two hull halves connect with the floor plate. Again, par for the course for plastic models like this one here. Now you notice I went ahead and omitted the front driver's hatch at this point of the build. The reason for that has to do with the clear inserts that get mounted to the underneath. Once everything is fully painted and weathered, the clear inserts will be added, and then the hatch will be mounted to the model at that point. From the hatch, also we have in the back some of the photo etch, which was supplied with the model, and of course was added at this point. And now that takes us to that of the side skirts, or the pieces of detailing which basically started this entire build for me in the first place. These are the kit original ones and were assembled out of box. And once fitted to the model, even in a test fit point, you'll see how they cover up the sections that were damaged when the original builder made his mistake. And the sections that are visible when the skirts are added, the bodywork totally eliminates any presence of the original damage whatsoever. From the hull now takes us to the turret. Now the turret again was pretty much completed at the point when I took over the build and I just basically finished it. I added the last of the photo etch for the front portion of the turret armor as well as the remainder of the tusk detail components such as the antenna bases, the commander's cupola and other things of that nature. Now, when it comes to the CITV lens, this was originally glued on by the other builder. However, when he glued it on, it was slightly cockeyed and I decided to pop it off. Luckily, he used the same glue that was mentioned before and the piece was able to be removed with not a whole lot of effort. I went ahead and cleaned up the areas where the unit was glued on to the tank, but on the CITV insert, as well as also on the mounting hole itself. Once fully cleaned off, the piece now sits on in a nice flush manner. However, will be added after the unit is fully painted because of the clear insert similar to that of the driver's hatch. For the commander's cupola, I went ahead and assembled it as the kit intended. 
The pieces are very nicely detailed and assemble very easily and pretty much effortlessly. Of course, the only caveat is the small size. It is very easy for a part to fling off out of your hand or a tweezer and go to the lost part of you, which is definitely not something that you want to have happen to your build. Now, you notice that the bulletproof glass segments are currently not installed. Of course, these will be mounted shortly after the model is fully painted. Moving from the cupola takes us to the last of the work that I needed to make to the turret in order to get it ready for painting, which is that of some seam removal. With the way the turret is designed, there's a small little seam that runs on the front portion here of the turret and goes around the edge here of the front. The seam is present on this model as well as it's also present on, again, most other plastic renditions of the Abrams. And with some sandpaper, I just polished it away and removed it. From there, I basically just polished up any other little bit of flash or any other bit of runner snippets that may have been left behind from the other builder. Just getting the turret again polished so I could get it into paint. And here's the model now fully completed. Let me go ahead and bring the model in closer in order to get a good idea on what was finished and the other work that went into this build. Starting with the model's tracks and the running gear, the running gear on the model here, again, was the same ones that were showcased before, and I didn't really do anything to them outside of give them a proper paint job. Now, the tracks, when they were removed from the lower hull, this made painting of the tracks and the wheels a lot easier, and I definitely recommend anyone who's building this kit to do the same procedure. It will save a whole bunch of time and solve a lot of headaches that can emerge specifically when trying to hand paint each and one of these components if they're already glued to the model. Now the track sections are the same Lincoln length assembly that was showcased before in the unboxing and I didn't do any sort of revisions to them whatsoever. The only fine tuning that I did do was that on some of the sections where the Indy links connect specifically on the rear here of the sprocket, I went ahead and polished it slightly with some sandpaper, which blended the joining sections and making for a nice smoother assembly. That was really the only polishing that was needed, and then the tracks just went into their painting procedure. Now, to paint the tracks, just like I do on the larger scale builds, on the M1 Abrams, just like on the other American tanks since World War II and onward, the tracks have rubber and steel components. When it comes time for painting, you want to paint these materials in two different colors in order to make them stand out from each other and preventing them from just blending in together. The way this was done was that the tracks were spray painted flat black. I also went ahead and weathered them with a few washes. And then with Tamiya, I believe it's called rubber black, I went ahead and painted the track pads with this material. This was also done on the inside of the track as well. This is the same procedure that I do on the larger scale builds and once done really makes the track pop compared to just leaving it with one shade. The CITV lens has been added permanently as we recall that was popped off during the build and you can see I went ahead and mounted on the commander's cupola armored shields with their clear plastic inserts. The clear plastic inserts went on very effortlessly, but I must warn, this has to be done with a lot of patience, as is very easily done where if you're clipping off the plastic, it could fling off to Lost Partia, and you're basically screwed. This was also true for the Commander's Cupola prisms as well. It's hard to get in frame, but all of the prisms that are on periscopes on this model have clear plastic inserts added. Moving our way to the rear bustle, you can see here a spare tire, which was kit supplied. And I also went ahead and threw on the bustle rack a spare sprocket tooth ring, which again was kit supplied. Here we can see the antenna is now fully painted. Again, all these components are built out of box with absolutely no mods needed to have been made. One final thing to point out about the clear periscopes, or I should say the armored bulletproof glass inserts is when it comes time for installation for the adhesives I actually use very thin and runny CA. This was applied very carefully with a bit of wire and I just dropped the adhesive onto the inner portions and the CA just ran around the perimeter sealing it to the clear plastic part. 
it was a very cautious again you're going to need to have exhibit a lot of patience for this assembly but once done the results are very beneficial and the pieces are nice and strong and you're not gonna have to worry about them popping off as the model ages now it takes us to the paint and the weathering now with this model here you are limited with the amount of variety and color schemes that this vehicle can be painted in for this model here i painted it with the way it's represented on the color palette as well as even on the box art which is overall desert sand. This is basically how American vehicles of today are painted. Now, just like on the box art, I went ahead and highlighted and changed the color of a few key components from the desert sand to NATO green. By doing this, this makes the tank pop and gives it a little bit more interest than just leaving everything with the monocolor of the desert sand. The funny thing is the paint and even with the way the pieces are highlighted are very similar if not in some ways identical to a recent 116 scale M1A2 build that I completed. Of course that video is found on the ECA channel. Just like on that build, I went ahead on and on the rear exhaust section, I painted this section here with a different shade of black. The reason for this has to do with that this section here has some heat resistant paint on it due to the extreme heats that's generated from the engine exhaust. By the way, that little factoid, I have to give credit to one of my subscribers who relayed that information to me in one of my other videos. You know who you are. Thanks for the heads up. In addition to the parts being painted green, this little black section here definitely makes the tank pop and gives it again a little bit more interest compared to leaving everything with the mono color. You can also see that the center portion where the actual exhaust manifold would emerge is has some more soot weathering and that color is different compared to the heat resistant paint which is painted on the piece overall. Moving from the exhaust takes us to the top deck grill work to make the pieces highlighted with a swipe of watered down black paint I added it to the grill work sections. Any extra was wiped off leaving for the look that you see here. Now at this point in the build I would go ahead and talk about the tanks decals and the markings but for this model here there aren't any from I've seen with the supply kit as well as with the instructions I don't think this model comes with any sort of markings whatsoever. What you see is basically what you get. Overall, I'm extremely thrilled on how the model turned out. This model here was definitely spared certain doom being either thrown in the trash or possibly even living out the rest of his days as a spare parts donor in a parts bin somewhere. Now, it has been a very long time since I've built a 172nd scale model. However, this model here, the build actually was very impressive. The amount of detailing as well as the way the overall kit was thought out and laid out was really nicely done. The quality of the moldings and the castings are definitely very impressive and I can imagine their 135th scale line to be equally as impressive. Now because the model was delivered in a mostly pre-assembled format in which the majority of the larger components were already pre-fitted and built by the previous builder, I can't really comment too much on the overall fit and finish of the parts. However, I will say that the amount of components that I personally had to build and add on to the model were very easily done and did not require basically any type of fitting or fine tuning. The moldings were very clean like I said before. There weren't any sinkholes or any other injection pins really to contend with. Like I said in the earlier portion when I got the model in its unboxing format, the kit itself has the overall fit and feel of a Tamiya 135th scale, albeit only a lot smaller being in 172. I will say that the model was a bit of a pleasant surprise in working on it, since I again don't really work on these smaller scale builds, and stretching my legs now and again in other areas is something that is beneficial. Now, even though my hatred of the Lincoln Link tracks are known far and wide, I will say that on this model here, the Lincoln Links weren't really that bad. Partially because they were already pre-assembled by the other builder, but because the majority of the spans were already pre-molded onto the wheel sections, this did simplify the amount of Lincoln Length required to assemble the tank. Now, personally, I'm still not a fan, and I'm not won over by this track method, in any way shape or form but on this model here it was somewhat tolerable 
However, I would prefer a set of vinyl tracks over the Lincoln Links on any day of the week. Moving to skill level and recommendation, because of the finely molded components as well as the small clear plastic and even the photo etch parts, I cannot recommend this model for a beginner. This Something like this is definitely way too intricate and a beginner is going to have some struggling dealing with a model of this complexity even in one 70 second scale. Something like this would be best for a intermediate and an advanced builder. Someone who definitely has several builds under his belt, as well as the type of patience and the adhesives and tools required to assemble some very small components, namely of course being the clear lenses on all the periscopes, as well as the other finely molded detail components that are found on the tank as a whole. Now, this model here, because of its subject matter, I definitely recommend for anyone who's an avid fan of modern and state-of-the-art armor modeling subjects. This bill here would definitely fit in a collection with Leopards, T90s, Merkavas, any other sort of vehicles of this era. This guy here would definitely fit in very nicely in that collection. Of course, this vehicle here would definitely apply for anyone who is an avid fan of Braille scale, which there are several individuals out there that really dig working on models of this scale. Of course, anyone who's an avid fan of the M1 Abrams tank family will greatly appreciate this build here and the Tusk 2 will easily fit into someone's collection that has the original M1, the M1A1, A2, all the way up to this variant that we have here. And finally another person who I would recommend this kit to would be someone who is an avid wargamer. There are a lot of people out there that like to do old school wargaming with models ranging from 148 scale and 170 second scale. Of course, this model here will easily fit right into that little niche and will definitely be a nice addition to that person's collection as well. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 170 second scale M1A2 Tusk 2 Abrams main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where you can get updates on new model showcase and project update videos when they get posted. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more pics of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on the ECA channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more larger and smaller builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.